In this episode, we have Dr. Megha with us to talk about Ayurveda and Ahar. Megha is a scientist who teaches and researches about food and nutrition, both from a biochemical as well as a cultural perspective. Megha's research focuses on gut health and what role traditional foods and practices play in this regard. In this episode, we talk about the definition of Ayurveda and how it should be understood, Ahar in the context of body and soul, the six rasas, how to incorporate them in a diet plan and much more. Needless to say, health and diet play a huge role in living a happy life. I hope you gain from this episode. Hi Megha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you Deepak, it's a pleasure to be here. It is indeed and um, uh, you are, I think you're the first uh, uh, person in this segment of, of being a scientific researcher and, and uh, more on the Ayurveda side. So most of the guests we have had till now have been more on the mental health side. I think we will approach that topic today also, but we'll also have some segments or at least some significant segments on, on the health of the body on its own. Uh, so Meha, Meha, before we start, a quick background on who you are, what your journey has been to this point. Um, so I describe myself as a scientist mm-hmm. um, and primarily because I've always been interested in the process of how science has been done um, and the wonderful world of biology. So I thought, you know, I should combine my interest in doing lab research with biology. And that's how I ended up being a biochemist. Um, but along the path, uh, I did a couple of different things. One is I worked for a funding agency and I realized that uh, one could do science even without being on the bench. Um, the second uh, uh, divergence in my career was uh, joining uh, the University of Transdisciplinary Health Sciences and Technology, TDU, where I am now, where there's a big focus on traditional knowledge systems and traditional medicine in particular. Uh, So I have now sort of combined my interest in biochemistry and uh, uh, started to um, understand and taking baby steps to look at traditional medicine, uh, specifically Ayurveda. And was it a a chosen career path to combine science and more of a traditional outlook towards your research or did that happen by serendipity? It was absolutely serendipitous. Mm-hmm. There was, there has been nothing in my educational background uh, with regard to traditional medicine. Um, I did Sanskrit as a subject in, in school because you had to take a third language. and I enjoyed Sanskrit as a language, but I have never really uh, thought about investigating uh, traditional knowledge claims. In fact, I've been brought up on a diet of uh, rejecting traditional knowledge claims because uh, they cannot be explained using modern biology. Hmm. Coming to TDU um, was a decision because they work with communities and uh, in the area of public health. And that was something I really wanted to do, Uh, take my lab knowledge to the outside world. And and this seemed like a very nice way to work with people, which is how I ended up coming here. But um, I started to talk to people, went to the library, started reading up. um, And I am in an environment which is very gentle. Nobody is pushing me to believe in anything. And so that has been a a wonderful journey, which I'm still I'm still on it and most likely going to be for a very long time um, of opening myself up to traditional knowledge rather than the other way around. Fascinating. So let's start with the, uh, with the, with the basics first. Uh, Ayurveda is obviously a, a very fancy word and very famous word these days. Uh, what is it? What is it not? And exactly how does anybody understand Ayurveda? Actually, understand Ayurveda both from a traditional point of view, but also in a more relevant, uh, biologically uh, significant point of view? Sure. Um, Let's break that uh, question down into two parts. But before that, a disclaimer, these are just my thoughts, Mm. my opinions, (laughs) and uh, a reflection of what I have been reading. So I apologize in uh, advance to any of our listeners who who are probably going to be much more professional in this than I am. 
Mm-hmm. So let's start with what is Ayurveda uh, to me. So if you um, look at it etymologically, you just break down words, right? Uh, it's a Veda. Uh, and uh, a Veda is philosophy. Uh, it's not a series of facts. It's, it's, a, it's a series of discussions uh, which meander and take you uh, through many different routes uh, to arrive at a certain philosophy. Um, and so when I started reading Ayurveda, I realized that you can't take away that philosophical aspect from it. Mm. Um, it's not like reading a biochemistry textbook. It's not reading a series of equations where magically the carbon dioxide and the amount of water that was used uh, equate and you get this beautiful uh, way of looking at glucose getting transformed into energy. So it's not that. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a series of discussions. It's, it's, it's suggestions. It is a reflection both on the physiology in terms of medicine, but it's also a reflection of the physiology in terms of the mind, in terms of the environment. Um, it was also codified at a time when the, our, the culture was very different, right? So I often find myself asking if if what is there is 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 gender biased or not, because I don't know if there are voices of women in there because of the time that it was written. Yet, on the other hand, uh, the amount of information in terms of pregnancy care, lactation, early childhood, all uh, activities typically undertaken by women are very elaborately mentioned. So clearly there was there, there must have been these voices, but I don't know if they've been recorded. Um, and lastly, it's, it's very experiential. Ayurveda, the way it's been written, um, it's it's about say something is hot or cold and you can still experience that today you know that warm feeling you'll get when you eat a pan right uh, i don't have to convince you that that it, it's making you feel warm you can experience it for yourself and and that way also i find it very philosophical because it is not expecting you to believe something um, dogmatically but through experience um, but that uh, is a direct contrast to uh, modern biology, in a sense, because a lot of science today we do is quantitative. We want numbers, right? I don't want to merely tell you that eating pan makes you warm. I want to be able to tell you how many degrees Celsius will your body temperature go up. Mm. And of course, we've not done that those types of experiments, right? Uh, we don't have a quantification. I can't tell you that in a in a population of thousands of people, uh, X percentage will experience five degree increase versus two degree increase. And that quantitation is missing. And it's in direct contrast to how we do science today, which is very, very quantitative. Second, uh, science we practice, we learn in school, we do in the lab. It's very reductionist, right? Um, we work on a molecule. Maybe I will work on a whole organism, but again, I take it in a test tube. It's a controlled laboratory environment. Um, there is standardization. We do all of this because I want somebody at the other end of the world to be able to replicate my work and get exactly the same result because mm-hmm. that is validation in, in, in scientific theory. That's validation. So uh, this uh, this process is not there in Ayurveda because it's guidelines, right? If you're living in Maharashtra, you do something else. If you're living in Meghalaya, you do something else. And, and they both will work, most likely. But um, I don't have the standardization. So those are the sort of the two ends that, that one has to juggle when one is doing traditional knowledge as well as uh, science, contemporary science. A few questions from that, uh, Megha. Uh, one is is a more academic question: is that what's the general consensus on the historical origins or the the time frame during which it was created? Um, and an attached question to that is: did it evolve over the centuries, or it is largely the same as it was when it was created? Right. So um, the, the the there are three major texts, and then there. Lots of commentaries on those texts. Mm -hmm. The three major texts are called Samhitas. And they are uh, the Charaka Samhita, 
Shushruta Samhita, and then there is something called Ashtangradeya of Vagabhat. We don't know if these were individual authors or they were schools. They have been written in a conversational style. The, teach, the student asks a question and the teacher responds. Based on the Sanskrit and, and the type of things that are mentioned, uh, dates have been allocated uh, to these texts, with Charaka Samhita being the oldest. Um, it was probably not written down till about the 7th or 8th century AD, but we think it might have actually been uh, developed as a textbook around uh, 200 to 600 uh, BC, right? But there's this long period where it was orally transmitted. Mm -hmm. And then the other two Samhitas come a lot later. And, and actually you can, it's sort of interesting, you can see, uh, you know, different, the evolution of society in these, in these texts as you see what sort of practices are performed. So in terms of dating, I would say this it's a it's a subjective matter. Mm -hmm. All we can say is that they're quite old. Mm -hmm. Now, after the 7th to 8th century, a few people wrote commentaries on these textbooks, but we haven't really seen a revision or a, a V2 of, of these texts taking into account modern information, right? So uh, starting 17th, 18th century, we started to know a lot about microorganisms. We could see cells and tissues under the microscope. So those aspects have not been uh, included uh, in, in Ayurveda. And largely, whatever students study are these texts that were written a good uh, uh, thousand years, two thousand years ago. Right. And, and connected to that is the is something which you mentioned that the quantitative aspect or even the empirical uh, way of looking at the new science or what we do is, is largely missing from Ayurveda. Now, uh, again, I, I did some some research some time back and I've, I've read Charak Samhita also. And uh, this is something which actually, I mean, I, I'm sure you have your re uh, the reasons why it is happening, because even the major pharma companies have an Ayurvedic line of products. Uh, and it would probably suit them also to have detailed studies and have so something mentioned that it is it might just be different for people living in warmer climates and it be different for people living in colder climates. Why is this sort of empirical evidence based supporting studies missing in Ayurveda? Mm, the little I understand is that the treatment protocols in Ayurveda are extremely personalized. Mm -hmm. Whereas treatment protocols that are executed in clinical trials have to be standardized. You have to get the standard treatment. Everybody gets the standard treatment, whereas in Ayurveda, everybody gets a personalized treatment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a it's a paucity at our end in terms of um, creativity. Like I think we have to come up with more creative ways of testing. Uh, Ayurvedic frameworks rather than say that the current framework doesn't work for us and so therefore uh, Ayurveda is not proved. I think that's the wrong way of going about it. I feel we must develop a framework where we can uh, analyze personalized recommendations on a population level. And would also the fact that these are a series of guidelines but there is also this philosophical element and which is which is always present in all the Indic knowledge systems, right? There is there is that philosophical part, which which definitely is much much harder to measure, and it's it's probably not simple or easy or even possible to separate philosophical part of Ayurveda and then measure what is left, which is why measurement is a, is a tricky aspect. Absolutely, absolutely, because I think the moment you enter into philosophy, uh, you start entering into belief systems, mm. right? And we know that. So in some treatment protocols, the placebo effect, just the thought that you're getting something uh, can uh, change the outcome of your treatment, right? And so this belief aspect can never be measured and that it would be silly for us to even try to quantify it. Um, and so we should accept it. I think, I think we have to accept that there are certain things that we will not be able to measure, which there will be a component for it and we should allow for, for, for that creatively in our measurement process, right? So for example, um, there are these standardized questionnaires that ask you quality of life, right? 
right? Mm. So in Ayurvedic treatments, uh, perhaps your biomolecular markers don't change, but your quality of life might have changed. So maybe we need to combine these kind of subjective parameters along with quantitative parameters when we are looking at uh, these traditional knowledge systems working integratively mm. with uh, modern science. I don't see this as an if or uh, if or if or you know either or mm. sort of thing. I look at it as an and uh, process, and we we must try and figure out how to uh, understand it better for ourselves. A final couple of questions, just on this academic front, before we move on to Ahar. One is uh, how prevalent or how important was the impact of religion in this whole Ayurvedic tradition? Was it a major part? Was it something which was largely left alone uh, in this Ayurvedic journey? Relation. Um, religion. Religion. Yeah. I think it's intimately tied. Mm. Intimately. Um, and we shouldn't ignore it. it. Both religion and philosophy are uh, intimately tied with it. And uh, we must accept it. Uh, mm. I, I, I think we try too hard to sort of uh, sieve out whatever we want from Ayurveda based on our worldview. Mm. Uh, and perhaps that might not be in the benefit of, of humanity in a sense. So I think we must acknowledge it and we must say that it obviously is intimately linked uh, with, with the practice. Uh, but And how do, how do we accept it and, and move on? Yeah. The second question is that this uh, lack of measurement, right? however we, we term it, it seems to have a byproduct. A byproduct is that in this uh, in the other sciences, in the heart sciences, it is easy to measure the proficiency of the practitioner, right? Or or the skills of a doctor. Uh, there are there are at least uh, standardized tests or structured tests. I would assume that byproduct or side effect has at least some implications when it comes to an Ayurvedic doctor or an Ayurvedic practitioner. It it, it makes it difficult to understand who is a good a uh, real practitioner and who who is not. Is that a, a real understanding? Uh, I will I'll place it a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in my experience, all physicians need experience, right? Now, whether that experience came from traditional knowledge or that experience came from uh, Western medicine, regardless, you need experience, uh, I think. Um, and uh, the quantitation, uh, even in uh, regular curricula, right, uh, makes... Uh, I think uh, physicians are a little too dependent on readouts, right? Now, these readouts can be uh, misleading. If if I'm going to measure blood sugar only as HbA1c or sugar in the blood, but I don't take into account the other uh, issues that are there, then maybe I'm not doing the best diagnosis uh, for, for a person. Um, and I'll, let me just talk from a biochemistry point of view because that's my expertise, right? So we can measure 200, 500 metabolites in the blood, right? Mm. But it's the physician who has to sort of put it all together. Now, what I find with Ayurveda physician is that they don't need those 500 metabolites, but they will look at phenotypes. They will ask you for certain questions mm. and likely arrive at the same diagnosis. That doesn't make one type of diagnosis wrong versus the other. It means that you can arrive at the same uh, inferences in two different ways. And I think they can be complementary because imagine if you can get to the same diagnosis without having to poke somebody and take their blood. right? But that's the kind of science that we need. We need to see what is the correlation. Can we arrive at this together? Uh, will it be systematic? You know. If I give you a protocol, will you be able to follow it step by step? Those, I think those are still we're quite far away from those uh, mm. scenarios. We have to build the science around. Perfect. So that was a great overview of understanding Ayurveda. Uh, moving on to our main topic of Ahar. Uh, could you give us a complete overview of what Ahar is? What I mean, how should we understand it both in regards of body, soul, mind? 
Okay. So I'll, again, you know, this is just very, very few years of study. So mm. with that disclaimer, um, uh, I read a sense that uh, you, your health is, is upheld by three pillars, the Traya Upasthamba. The three pillars are food, sleep, and uh, celibacy is one way of interpreting it. But I'll use the Sanskrit terms, right? So it is Ahar, Nidra, and Brahmacharya. So Brahmacharya, I think, can also be interpreted as uh, having restraint, right? Like being very mindful of your lifestyle rather than just celibacy alone. Nidra. Actually, this is wonderful because this is one of the few uh, knowledge systems, medical knowledge systems that places so much emphasis on sleep that you have to have good sleep uh, in order to be healthy, right? And last is ahar. And the ahar component, what I, you know, was new to me and I really enjoyed in, in Ayurveda is that it is both um, food as food, as nourishment, right? The rice and the roti that we eat, but also food for the mind. It is ahar for your entire system, right? And uh, I'll take the example of, uh, say, rasgulla, right? A rasgulla is a sweet. It, it is, if you enjoy sweets, you'll find it satiating, you know, and it will fill your mind with uh sorry, your mouth with happiness, right? But it also fills your mind because you're, the moment you see a rasgulla and you like it, you feel happy, right? Mm -hmm. um, another example I can give you is uh, of hearing sweet music, right? Um, you can hear an instrument that you find very sweet, maybe a flute in the morning, right? And your mind will be filled with happiness. Um, and finally, you know, they're, they're all the same molecule. There's dopamine rush that happens when we feel um, rewarded or happy, right? So all of these things are considered to be ahar, right? The sweet music, the sweet food, etc. So ahar is not just food that you have to digest. It can also be a thought that you have to digest. Maybe you hear, heard a, a, a aphorism or you heard a shloka in the morning and you are just digesting it through your body. So all of those things are considered ahar. And what would then be the next step towards, towards going a little, one step further into ahar and how to incorporate it into our lives? So um, there is something called uh, the uh, uh, Ashta Ahara Vidhi, right? So if you really want to do dietetics, uh, Charaka Samhita has eight principles that he's put down. Um, he or the school has put down. And uh, these eight principles are what you should take into consideration when planning a diet, right? And it includes uh, uh, the person, that you have to understand the person. You have to understand where the food is coming from, where do you live, uh, what season it is, what your age is, how the food is processed. Uh, etc. So there are eight such uh, parameters, but they're all finally understood in the dimension of uh, three states, physiological states called Vata, Pitta and Kapha. And these can be tied in together, both in terms of your mental attributes and your physiological attributes. And could you explain a little bit more on this, uh, these three dimensions of both physical and mental attributes? Right. So, uh, Ayurveda posits that these three dimensions are there in, in all of us. Mm -hmm. The amount in each person varies, right? And that is what is responsible for the differences between you and I, right? And these differences manifest themselves in characteristics that have to do with uh, body type, metabolism, uh, mental state, uh, uh, the emotions that we experience, how we process these emotions that we experience, how we process the food that we eat, etc. So uh, I don't want to belabor the point between the three of these, mm -hmm. but all I'd like uh, the listeners to know is that there are these three dimensions and each one of us has all three of them. Just the amount varies. The same three attributes 
can be understood in terms of the food that we eat, right? So the food acts to balance what we have in our bodies. So if I have too much of vata, then perhaps I should eat foods that will lower the amount of vata that I have so that they can be a little bit in sync. But if I have a lot of vata and I eat foods that are also increasing vata, then I'm going Mm -hmm. to upset or imbalance my body. For example, take uh, uh, rajma, right? Bean, right? Beans of any kind, rajma, chana, right? Now, all of these are protein-rich foods. Uh, But there are certain people who would eat rajma and find that the flatulence increases a lot or they feel very Mm. gaseous, right? Now, in the same family, other people might eat that rajma and feel no discomfort at all. Right now, that protein is the same for everybody. Yet mm-hmm. all of us are digesting it in completely different ways, right? And so uh, Ayurveda tries to give you a little bit of correlation between your body state and the effect that that food is going to have on your body state. And was there any correlation between the other famous trilogy of uh, Satvik, Tamsik, and Ratsik Gunas, or was that completely separate? Yeah, so what I understand is those gunas are states of the mind. Mm-hmm. Whereas this vata pitta kapha is state of the entire system, per se. Right? And there are foods that are considered sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. But um, in the ashta ahara vidhis, all the descriptions are to do with vata pitta and kapha. And they don't actually go into this... Uh, sattvic, tamasic, uh, rajasic uh, level at all. That seems to have come about a little later okay. uh, as far as the classic are concerned. And was there any hierarchy in between Vat, Pitta, Kaf? Huh, very good question. None whatsoever. And, and this is one of the things I love about Ayurveda. Hmm. So it says that, look, everybody has all three. Right. One might think that, oh, there should be a balance between the three of them and then you're some sort of superior human being. It doesn't say that at all. All it says is everybody has all three. Figure out what proportion you are of which three and figure out how to balance it for yourself. Swasthya. Swasthya. So it is yourself you have to figure out for in terms of food or behavior, etc. It is not about population-based uh, understanding. And it is certainly not a competition with anybody else. Mm. The competition is within you. Can you keep swastya for yourself? And what advice you give yourself, work for somebody else altogether. So the idea is that you have a certain constitution. You try your best not to perturb that constitution. Keep it as it. So even if you're very high vata or very high pitta, accept that that's your constitution. Figure out how to manage it. There is no like a state that is summer for everybody. Summer mm-hmm. is for yourself. The summer dosha is for yourself. You should feel that you have reached a certain level of homeostasis. And to understand which of these matapita kapha is, is more dominant in my own body for, for swasthya, is that a work which only a trained practitioner can do? Or can we also figure it out for ourselves? Absolutely. I think that this is something that only a Vaidya should should go to a good Vaidya and figure it out. There are innumerable such tests on the internet. Mm -hmm. Take it as you would like you would take any personality test, Mm -hmm. right? But I would uh, strongly caution against jumping into conclusions simply based on something that you did online. First. Second, I'd like to warn our listeners is that See, in the text for Vata, for example, it says that uh, it is Sara or mobile, right? Now, that mobility is an English word. I have interpreted that mobility and said, okay, this person walks fast, talks fast, right? Not all of these attributes have been put down in the text. These are inferences, Mm -hmm. right? They are very good inferences, no doubt, but they are still inferences, right? Second, when you look at a test online, it gives you numbers, right? There's nothing in the, te- in the Samhitas about numbers. Like I said, there's no quantitation. The Samhitas are not saying that 33.3% Vata, Pitta and Kapha equals 100% of a human being. They're not saying that, right? So 
the quantitation that has been applied in order to give you a score online has no classical basis to it at all. So therefore, I would say go to a <laughs> Ayurveda Vaidya, a good Ayurveda Vaidya, and they will be able to tell you what is your prakriti. Things online are at best fun. And just to carry over from that, I'm assuming that even the, the the dominancy of any one of these would be changing as we age with the weather or with different conditions. No, I. What my understanding is that your prakriti is fixed okay. um, at conception, but its manifestation changes. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, Pitta individuals who are naturally very warm and hot tempered, right? Perhaps younger in life, you don't have that much regulation. You don't appreciate that your temper is causing an issue. But as you age, you take up meditation, right? And so you become much more calm and you don't lose your temper. That doesn't mean your Pitta nature has changed. It just means that you've been able to master it. Its manifestation has changed. You might still get as angry, but perhaps you're just better at controlling it, better at understanding it, and better at not having it come out as you did earlier in life. That doesn't mean your prakriti has changed, you've mastered it. So the manifestation has changed, not the inner nature. Interesting. So would that also mean that uh, even in the case of, let's say you have a, a very severe disease, some sort of, like, even a heart ailment or heart attack, uh, that all is part of a manifestation. Your your actual prakriti still remains the same. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it uh, the little that I understand from uh, Ayurveda that means the 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 ailment is usually a manifestation of an imbalance in your mm. dosha. So you started out with something, and that should have you should have tried to maintain the homeostasis, but you know stuff happens and. And that homeostasis is altered. And so your heart condition is a manifestation of the altered homeostasis, which frankly is not different from the kind of language that we would use in biochemistry also. Interesting. So uh, moving on, Mega is, is a, I mean, one of the themes we should like to discuss today are the rasas in, in Ayurveda. Mm. Uh, could you take that one forward, please? Right. So... Um, um, when we started doing Ayurveda dietetics courses, right, mm -hmm. I was completely used to describing food as uh, protein rich, carbohydrate rich, fat rich. Why? Because as a biochemist, I can take a food, I can uh, dissect it out, put it through a bunch of different uh, instruments and then tell you exactly what was the chemical composition. And based on the chemical composition, I would call something sugar rich, protein rich or, or fat rich, right? Mm -hmm. However, the Ayurveda framework for uh, describing food is very different. And one, uh, it's, it's actually called Rasa Panchaka. There are five ways, five, five ways in which you can describe the food. And the first way is Rasa. Now, now Rasa actually, in dance or music, Rasa is emotion, right? Uh, rasa in, in here is taste. Mm. Uh, this is another mind and food connect. Uh, in a sense, it's a play on words. It's beautiful Sanskrit. Right. So the rasa, there are six rasas and these six tastes are uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, pungent and astringent. Right. Shada rasa. So six tastes. And these six tastes should be there in all the food that we eat in the sense that all the meals that we make should have shada rasa. What can change is the proportion of the amount based on your prakriti. Um, so let's just talk about these six tastes, right? Uh, let's start with the first one, the sweet or the madhura. Now, although we uh, interpret it as madhura, a uh, sweet taste. It actually includes foods like um, uh, rajma, which uh, biochemically you consider, you know, protein rich, but it's actually madhura rasa in in, uh, in in Ayurveda, right? So it's not just things that are sweet. Uh, these uh, are foods that will make you feel satiated, fulfilled, right? Contentment, they're supposed to give you a feeling of contentment, right? Uh, then comes sour foods, right? Now, uh, sour foods, are, they, will, they are ruchya, right? They will make your mouth water, right? 
Just that anybody who has that practice of putting a little bit of lemon juice right mm-hmm. into their little food, it 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 enhances uh, uh, how well you feel uh, something is tasty, right? Uh, so that's sour or amla rasa, right? Then comes uh, salty or lavana. Now, salt uh, in the classics is not just NaCl. Uh, there are at least eight different types of salts, and I don't think we've quite figured out what the different types are, but in Indian cuisine, we already use many of them. So there's the rock salt, right? The kala namak that we put in the salads. There is the saindhavna lamak that comes from uh, caves in the Himalayas. Um, it's a much more cooling salt, lots of minerals. There's, of course, regular sea salt as well. And salt also has this property of uh, of uh, enhancing the taste of all the other rasas, right? It, mm. the, when food is missing salt and you add salt, it Everything gets heightened, right? All all the tastes get heightened. Mm-hmm. Then uh, comes uh, your uh, uh, tik the rasa, right? Bitter bitter taste. Now bitter taste evolutionarily we never uh, uh, um, consume a lot of because bitter compounds are also toxic. Mm-hmm. So we are very very cautious. Our we have a heightened sense of bitter taste in our mouth because you don't want to take too much of the wrong food, right? Uh, then comes uh, pungent, right? Now, pungent is anything that is spicy in the sense of heat producing, right? Um, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, chilies came to India only about 400 years ago. And the, pr- the predominant pungent rasa, uh, the katu taste, is actually pepper, pepper, mm-hmm. pippali. These are all the things that we used to consume and still do uh, in terms of the spicy taste, right? Hot taste. And the last is astringent. Now, this is a very interesting category because if you look at taste as we talk in modern uh, language, right? We have sweet, sour, umami, bitter, Mm -hmm. salt, but we don't have this astringent or kashaya rasa. Now, this kashaya rasa is uh, uh, things that you find in raw plantain, right? It, it dries out your mouth. Um, if you also had a tea made of pomegranate uh, um, uh, skin, not, not the actual pomegranate, that also is a little kashaya, but the skin is even more kashaya. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll have this drying sensation. And this is a very interesting rasa because we don't think about it much while making foods but just the act of act adding coriander seeds right when we add dhania powder we've added kashaya rasa to our meal so if you deconstruct a uh, indian everyday meal of dal sabji roti we will most likely be eating all six rasas we just don't we probably not analyze it in that way and it's a good idea to put these rasas in if you feel that your meal is missing one of them Interesting. So one small question is, where does water fit into all of this? Water is a food group on its own. Okay. And uh, the rasas, the rasa, there is no rasa per se of water. Different waters in Ayurveda have different properties depending on whether, you know, it is well water, rain water, river water, whether it's a fast flowing river or it's a river that goes through alternating droughts and um, uh, uh, rainfall, etc. So water doesn't come into the Rasapanchaka purview, but it comes as a food group. And does the, the rasa change based on whether the food is raw or cooked? Or does it remain the same? Yes. So it might not change. It might certainly, it's like a fan dial. You know, it can go down or go up. Hmm. Right. So you can change, for example, let's take rice. Right? Rice is Madhura Rasa, right? Now rice you can consume when you have it as part of poha. Right. That's flattened rice. You have that same rice in Dilpuri when you have Murmura. Right mm. now, both of them are madhura rasa, right? But their uh, attributes change because one is flattened rice. You've taken an entire rice kernel and then just made it flat, so it's very dense, nutritionally dense food. Mm-hmm. That same rice kernel, I have put air into it and puffed it up, right? So, same rice, 
ditto in terms of if biology but the rasas have become uh, the rasa panchakas have become a little different one is lighter a bhel puri is lighter your the same amount of bhel puri that you eat you might not be able to eat the same amount of poha right but it's coming from that same one rice kernel right. because one is heavy and one is light right so yes the rasa panchakas change the madhura rasa will go down perhaps a little bit but it will not go away you will cannot turn something that is madhura rasa to a katu rasa and does uh, so every food is it only one rasa or is it also combination of different rasas in different percentages is that how it works <laughs> yes so all foods have all the rasas and it's just sort of the dominance of mm. of the rasa right and uh, the classic example actually for something that has many rasas is amla or indian gooseberry right so amla has all the five rasas except salt or lavana so you know eat your amla with a little bit of salt and you've got shadanas sorted is is that why it almost became like a poster boy of indian ayurveda that everybody wants to uh, prescribe amla for every situation is that the reason why it it's it is the poster fruit i must say um amla is what is called as a rasayana mm. so there are a few foods that, there are two things about amla that are interesting one is this rasayana business and the second one is something called nitya sevaniya aahar mm. now there are some foods that ayurveda says you can eat every day it doesn't say you know stuff your face with it just says you can eat these foods every day that list has a uh, rice wheat uh, moong dal um uh, uh jungle mamsa or or meat from jungle animals um uh then it has uh, pomegranate and it has amla as two fruits right it also has dairy products like ghee which it says you can eat every day uh the second so it, it's a amla is a nitya sevaniya aahara you can eat every day without uh, it being toxic for you uh and the second is that it's a rasayan so a rasayanas are foods that are rejuvenating mm-hmm. right and so amla is one of those rasayanas there are quite a few different types of rasayanas but amla is probably the most accessible easy to get right and so it's become very popular and i must say that the evidence for amla as a uh, fruit is is out there and it's 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 substantial and i would say that it's quite good and one more question i think we didn't cover it earlier which just came out is the distinction between vegetarian and non vegetarian where does that figure in into all of this ayurveda is very open hmm. they have food groups and one of the food groups is mamsa or meat hmm. and both for health and for diseased conditions they would have recommendations of what you can eat with meat so they have it's there is no um uh rule that you have to be vegetarian in order to be satvic etc uh it, it ayurveda ref, it, i think reflects very nicely the culture of our country then and today that mm. you know you'll have different people with different beliefs it's also very clear you know you feed satmya food you eat things that you eat every day so it will certainly never advocate meat soup to a patient who's vegetarian it like knowledge that that person has a different belief system and so mm. will not recommend it but if this person were okay with meat products they would certainly be provided a meat soup to recover or for their diet etc so it it's i would say very open and this is consistent in all the three samhitas yes yes uh, just coming back to the rasas so where do these rasas then correlate with the vat pitta kapha situation uh, <laughs> i think that that is a nuanced uh, i mean that's a very long answer it's also nuanced answer so i will just give an example mm-hmm. right so madhura rasa for example is something that pacifies both a vat dosha and a pitta dosha but it will aggravate a kapha dosha so if mm-hmm. an individual has predominance of kapha they would do good to avoid madhura rasa or reduce the amount of madhura rasa in their diet whereas vata and pitta people can uh, handle it a lot 
better and so they can include it but you know this is not licensed to say that you can put five spoons of sugar in your uh, tea if you're a vata or a pitta individual right again uh, you choose your madhura rasa very carefully you know you don't have to be eating just plain glucose like i said even rajma or beans is madhura rasa so you could be eating a more protein rich food and eating mm-hmm. less uh, sugar but uh, a vata a pitta individual probably can handle rajma a lot better than a vata individual right so you choose your madhura compounds based on your prakriti and that's just one example i'll give and that's the same for all the rasas will have different pacifications and aggravations for the various uh three states of being right and so with with that context and that background how does listeners or anybody who's beginning into this journey how should they go about planning a diet a healthier diet for the mind body soul see at the bottom line ayurveda is about experience mm. so you write down for yourself how you feel after eating foods x y and z that i think is universal you can apply that whether you come from modern dietetics or you come from ayurveda right you mm. see what a food does to you a method of preparation does to you what chilies do to you maybe uh, eating dried chilies is a much better option for you than eating green chilies right so that out of the way in terms of planning diets mm. um the relationship between prakriti and of the food and the individual they are correlated and you will find it both in the classical texts and there are innumerable uh, web uh, services also catering and the information is not all wrong they are good as guidelines but you have to you have to figure out what it does to your body for yourself mm-hmm. right um first second um if you are confused and it's always better to go to a uh, vaidya and, and get it clarified for yourself i think one has to be very cautious about taking advice that comes from the internet taking an advice that comes from your neighbor auntie or taking advice that comes from you know somebody who says we've traditionally done this because what we've seen in the ayurveda dietetics course that we hold is that a lot of people mistakenly believe that all traditional knowledge is coming from ayurveda that's not true at all hmm. there are some traditional knowledge that is just coming from traditional knowledge in your home right you know i mean one traditional knowledge which has massive public health consequences is uh the feeding of the colostrum the first milk that comes uh when uh, a baby is born and has to be given there are some communities that don't give colostrum at all out of a traditional belief and that's really sad because that's just packed with nutrients for the child right so let's not conflate traditional belief and ayurveda let's remember that ayurveda is codified science and tradition some of it can come from ayurveda and some came from wherever it is that your cultural background was and whatever influences were there for that tradition in terms of diet and so it's not a good idea to reject your traditional diet also because <laughs> it didn't come from ayurveda right um i think it's it's a good idea to um uh, eat a diverse plate eat in season eat foods that are local and keep a track record of what those foods are doing for you i know this is completely antithesis of you know here are five ways to make your life better kind of mm. advice that you see <laughs> these days but if i've learned anything in the last few years i read the encourages self exploration uh and looking at yourself and seeing what things work for you you also mentioned that there are some foods like amla which can be have had yes. daily so these are the yes yes are they also yeah. some no nos never to have ah uh, no and as a even when uh, it talks about foods for um, that are contraindicated like you know i said madhura rasa for kapha individual it never says don't eat madhura hmm. rasa all it's saying is eat lesser madhura rasa so uh, the idea is that you have all these shadar rasas but you manage their combinations um and a no food will always be specifically for you right if you know that um uh, uh, consuming a certain food gives you allergic reaction avoid it mm. but that's there's no population level no food interesting and is there some sort of guidance on the timing of when to eat yes so uh the day itself is divided into uh 
time periods for vata pitta and kapha so um, ayurveda suggests that you eat in in the pitta kala which is 10 to 2 right 10 mm. in the morning to 2 in the afternoon because you'll just have, your digestion will be better it also suggests that you eat with the with the chronological clock of the sun so sunrise sunset you try and be mindful of that and we know now from from uh, modern science that the, the circadian rhythm plays a major role uh, in hormones in in metabolism and so there there is a little bit of overlap in the kind of advice so yes try and eat with the sun uh, try and eat uh, uh, your meals within that uh, time period might be very hard for those people who live in climates that have very short uh, mm. Uh, daylights but uh, try and eat as part of the circadian rhythm of the place that you are in certainly yeah and any guidance as to the so one of the common themes again in five ways to live happily or <laughs> in good health is is not to eat two hours before sleeping or or something like that right how many hours before sleeping should you eat is is that somewhere there and i think the physician uh, who i like very much um, uh, advises that you keep at least 3 hours between two meals yeah mm. and 3 hours before you go to sleep right so that it's all digested before you go to bed that was his advice um i have not come across this in the classics but i think this is experience talking mm. to you this is why it's important to go and talk to a vaidya <laughs> for mm. for the right advice yeah yes I'm... um actually sorry um the but one thing i also want to mention i think this is something easy that people can do in terms of diet mm-hmm. right and that is the concept of rashi which also comes in this ashta ahara vidhi framework and quantity right so we are very consumed with how many calories you ate etc etc ayurveda has a cheat sheet for this and i think it works beautifully so there are two formulas that you can use you can choose whichever is convenient um both of these formulas divide your food into three categories first is solid food second is liquid food and the third is empty <laughs> which is like you know you don't eat any it's the empty portion right mm. so you can either eat one third solid one third liquid one third empty mm. or you can do uh one one half solid one fourth liquid and one fourth empty and this there's very good support we know calorie restriction uh improves health improves life span right so this is a great way to do calorie restriction mind you this is not nutrition restriction it's not saying eat less rice eat more dal mm. all it's saying is in your normal food have you know about a, a half of solid food so your dal chawal will be your solid food right a quarter of liquid now if you if you think that you eat too much your that water liquid can be water it can be buttermilk it can be mm. uh, juice um Or it can be a fruit juice, whatever, whichever combination you want to go for, and your that quarter or that one third, depending on your body, has to be empty. So, um, even um, uh, in uh, modern science, we know that you know about eighty percent. If you're eating to about eighty percent fullness, you've got the uh, formula right in terms of how much to eat. Uh, just connected to that, Mika is that. did fasting or does fasting occur or what sort of role does fasting play in the whole ayurvedic concept and just connected to that also is that did intermittent fasting <laughs> come somewhere there or it was a very new development okay so um intermittent fasting is when uh, you eat for only a certain period of time uh, during the day so the day has 24 hours and you can eat just for 8 hours and you can choose those 8 hours mm. so uh, it could be from 12 in the afternoon to 8 at night uh, for example right um intermittent fasting in is just another way of doing calorie restriction mm-hmm. right uh in my opinion as far as fasting in ayurveda is concerned it's called langhana right now ayurveda is very clear that langhana should be done based on the person so it does not have a one formula fit all langhana for everybody right some people will need if the if your agni is really uh, going very strong you will need inputs of food or you're just end up eating yourself more or less right mm. uh, it reminds me of those people who are hangry right if you don't get a meal you're suddenly like very angry and you're just out of control right so it doesn't it, it there is no 
no rule for fasting. People should fast according to their Agni, according to their Bala, right? Again, experience-based fasting. And the fasting at one extreme can be not eating and drinking anything, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, nir, nirjal, like no water, no food, no nothing. Right away, right down to fasting in a sense of, you know, I, I'll skip a meal or I will just have fruits for a meal, etc. So that span is, is, is large and again has to be determined by the person. And mm-hmm. if you have not fasted before or that's not part of your regimen, it is again advisable that you seek uh, formal uh, advice before you launch into a fasting. And what fast works for one person may not work for you because your metabolism, your prakriti might be completely different. Interesting. Uh, this is, I mean, we touched upon this in the beginning, but just a quick question. Uh, uh, you said that Ayurveda is, is largely the same as it was when it was created in the, these Samhitas, but was there any influence on either side with, with other uh, traditional systems, Yunani or uh, Siddha or something else? Okay. Um, I think, yes, the answer is definitely yes. I think that mm-hmm. there has been give and take. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, it has evolved in that sense, you know. So there has definitely been give and takes. And you'll see different things in the Nigantus that are written uh, mm-hmm. in, in the last 500 years as opposed to some things that were a year back. Yes, certainly. There has been a, a lot of give and take. We must also acknowledge here non-codified forms of traditional medicine that that are practiced by indigenous folk that have not been mm. codified, right? Uh, India has a large number of indigenous uh, uh, tribals who have been practicing medicine and they've, they've done a fantastic job uh, uh, keeping their communities alive for 5,000 years uh, mm. plus, right? So. Uh, we don't acknowledge those and we must because Ayurveda certainly is clear that that's how its its own knowledge base accrued through the experiences of people around it by watching nature. So there's something called ethno-veterinary, right? By watch, watching animals, how they treat themselves uh, in the forest. So all of these have gone into making Ayurveda. And I don't feel that it's right to uh, take away all of these lovely cultural uh, and uh, uh, ethno um, uh, practices that have not made it into the Samhita, but are Mm. still existent. Right. And uh, one more thing, uh, where does weather fit into all of this? So for example, I'll just Mm. give you a quick example. Uh, So curd is something which is often recommended in in summers, Mm. but when it comes to winters, Right. The, the general consensus is that it it will it can give you cold or it can give you mm. a sore throat and stuff. Mm. So how does weather and climate relate into this picture? Thank you. So weather in the Ashtahara Vidhi Kalpana that will come at uh, its kala or time, right? Um, so if you think from a, uh, from a farmer's point of view for a minute, right? Mm-hmm. Weather determines what you sow, right? And what you reap uh, in terms of when something will be harvested as well, right? Hmm. So a lot of our traditional food practices without even doing Ayurveda practice this because a bajra ki roti is best eaten in the winter since it's Hmm. heavy as opposed to the summer when your digestion is not that good, right? And so these practices, if you uh, want to look at them academically, I would encourage people to look at their own household traditional practices, seeing where they live, And actually also comparing them to the weather of the place that they live in right now. I always give this example in my class. You are a Rajasthani, right? And you are are used to eating bajri ki roti and lots of ghee and spice in the winter. Mm -hmm. Now you move to Trivandrum in January. Trivandrum will not have the same winter as you will have in Rajasthan in Mm -hmm. January, right? Um, Because of you know, wonderful road system and uh, marketing, you'll get bajra flour in Trivandrum, right? But will that bajra flour uh, be digested in the same way in Trivandrum as it would be in the cold region of uh, uh, Rajasthan? I think it's, I think the body will tell you, you will, Hmm. your own body will tell you based on the experience, whether you know, the Hindi saying is khana hazam ho raha hai, whether it is getting digested or not. 
Similarly, uh, if I were to sort of, you know, take my uh, uh, rasam rice and, and move to Rajasthan, right? Is that the right place for me to be eating rasam rice? Mm-hmm. But there are two contradictory things here, right? One is I'm taking a food that is a lo- uh, local to one place and going another place. But I am used to that food, right? Mm. So what do I do if I go to another place? Mm. So the out is this. Uh, the hack is that when you go and change different climates, try and dial down what you are eating and dial in to what that particular place is eating. So don't abandon your bajre ki roti. Just eat a little less of it over a period of time and start adapting to whatever is the food of that particular place. But don't you don't have to give up your bajra roti altogether. It's just, like I said, everything is dialed down or dialed up. Nothing is yes or no. Would it be correct to say that neither the individual's prakriti nor the rasa of the food change? It was a manifestation which was changing in both of these scenarios? Correct. Yes, yes. Interesting. Uh, it's it's been fascinating, Mega. But before we end, uh, any any particular shloka or story or anecdote, which again, so why I ask this is because I would love to know uh, something which has stayed close to your heart, right? uh, your own individual journey. Is there something you would like to share? Um, I think there's a it's a saying, and it, it d- deeply echoes with me, uh, which is that absence of evidence is not evidence mm. of absence. And I think as scientists, we have to be very careful. What is it exactly that my experiment is answering, right? And I'll give you an example for this. So... Ayurveda very categorically says, don't eat curd at night. And Mm. I, for the life of me, have not been able to figure out the logic, right? Because even for me to test it, right? For me to even say that it is bad or it is good, I need to understand why it has been uh, even given as as a claim, Mm. right? But that doesn't mean I I should reject it. Because... Mm. Just because I have not been able to come up with a method to test it doesn't mean that it's not correct. So the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I think we must remind ourselves that what we observe, what we perceive is all based on our own inherent biases or the kind of equipment that is available to me or how I asked my question. And these are all things that go into making a good scientific method, but they're also very good at making sure that you answer only a particular question. And so you should be wary about what you know and don't know. And in my case, what I have discovered is not to reject something simply because the proof has not been presented to me in a way that I can understand. Perfect. And this actually ties into what we started with. We started with you explaining that there is a philosophical aspect to Ayurveda. And when we try to force fit our empirical mind, uh, frames, structured frames onto it, we are actually doing a disservice and not understanding what it is. And it circles back to your final comment, which is that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's been really wonderful, Mega. Lots and lots of learning in this session. Thank you so much for taking the time. And, and coming here and sharing your learnings. Thank you so much, Deepak. I think you've given me an opportunity to articulate many of my thoughts. And it's a it's a real privilege. And, and I hope that this has been of use. I, I certainly found it very useful. And I hope the listeners find it useful as well. Thank you for the opportunity. So did I, Mega. Thanks a lot.